to this event. My name is Anne, and I'm the event host. It's only with your support that we're able to host events like this, so I encourage you all to purchase a book, continue to support your local authors, as well as your local indie bookstores. If you haven't yet purchased a copy of Sex in the Sea, we've got copies at the desk behind us. You can get Mara to sign it after she speaks and paper it downstairs at the front registers on your way out. I'd like to remind you all that we offer uh, parking validation for anyone that makes a purchase, and Reader's Guild members can reserve seats at any in-store event. At this time, please take a mo moment to turn off all cell phones and electronics. And while you do that, I'll tell you a little about Mara. Dr. Mara J. Hart is the research co-director for the nonprofit Future of Fish. A coral reef ecologist by training, she is a former research fellow at Blue Ocean Institute. Her articles have appeared in academic and popular media, including Scientific American, The American Prospect, and Scuba Diver Magazine. And now, please help me in welcoming Mara Hart. Thank you, Erin. Well, thanks everybody for showing up tonight, especially after the snow this morning. I'm excited to share with you guys a little bit of information about the weird and wild sex lives of marine life. But I always like to start uh, <laughs> taking a step back because you write a book called Sex in the Sea and you can get some pretty weird looks. People are wondering kind of what's going on. So why sex? Why should we care at all about the ways that animals do it in the ocean? And the answer is actually pretty simple. It's that sex is the heart of sustainability. So sex is what drives those giant bait balls of sardines and anchovies that then fuel the huge amounts of fish that feed us. Sex is also what allows for the prolific procreation of oysters that build giant reefs that protect our shorelines. Sex is also behind diversity. So when the sperm from one individual mixes and mingles with the egg that comes from another individual, a totally unique genetic blueprint is formed. So each of you are like a snowflake. Your combination of DNA has never been seen before. And that DNA can hold resources that nature relies on as an insurance policy against things like disease or changes in prey, so that you always have individuals and new species coming about that can help buffer against those kind of changes. So if we want our kids and their kids and even ourselves to be able to continue to enjoy all this bounty that the ocean provides in terms of food, in terms of medicine and material resources, shoreline protection, then we have to ensure that the shrimp and lobster and fish and whales of the ocean continue to make their own babies for the next generation. And the truth is right now, it may be hard to believe, but animals are having a little bit of a hard time getting lucky in the deep. And we are partly to blame for this. This may surprise you, but we're actually all a little bit more intimately connected with the intimate acts of the ocean than we realize. And part of the reason why this is hard to conceive of is because when we look out at the sea, this is what we see, right? It's, it's hidden. These are very fleeting moments that happen far from shore and far from our sight. And the other reason why it's hard to really understand how we can impact these sex lives is because they are so, so different in many cases than what we imagine as sex. It can be hard to anticipate how we might be impacting them. And I'll give you an example. This is Ocidax. So Ocidax is a deep sea worm that is found on whale bones. And this is a sample of a whale bone that was brought up from the Monterey Canyon at a couple thousand feet. <clears throat> and Ocidax, os comes from the word bone, and dax means devour. So these are bone devouring worms from the deep. And they were only discovered about 10 years ago. And when scientists first went down and saw, using remote operated vehicles, these animals covering these whale bones, they noticed a couple of things were really weird. The first thing was they have no mouth and no gut. Instead, what these animals do, and you can see this is a single animal like here, they form these tubes and they have these burrowing features that kind of are like roots that dig into the bone and they liquefy it. And then the fats and the proteins in the bone seep through their skin into these bulbous cavities that are filled with bacteria. The bacteria then digest all that nutrient and then the Ocidax digests the bacteria through their skin. Really weird. The second thing that the scientists noticed was that while they have no mouth and no gut, they had very, very well-formed ovaries and only ovaries. They only found females. Every single one of these was a female. But they were also filled with these tiny little black specks, which we assume were the sperm. So you have all these females and there are sperm but no males. 
took them about a year to solve this problem, like where were all the males of these, these worms. And so a researcher named Dr. Greg Rouse, who's at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, decided one day, he just was getting fed up with this, and so he's like, I'm just going to take a really close look. So he put these worms under a very, very high-powered microscope, and he sliced them and was looking deeper and deeper, and he finally zoomed in on these little black specks. And he had a moment of what he says was probably one of the biggest shockers of his life, which was that he discovered that these weren't sperm, these were actually the males. So these females harbor harems of dwarf parasitic males up to 100,000 times smaller than they are. So that was kind of weird. The third thing was, though, how did these males get there? Right? So how do they collect all of these little love slaves for themselves? And what turns out to happen, they think, it's a work in progress, but we're pretty sure, is that when these worms are babies and are larvae swimming through the ocean, they have very good sensory systems to hone in on where the whale fall might be. So they swoop in, and the first ones to arrive become these females. They set down these roots, they grow these tubes, and they feed off the currents, and, and feed off the bacteria. The latecomers, so the baby worms that are a little bit slow to arrive, they start to arrive to the whale fall and then are hit with these chemicals that the females are putting out. And those chemicals actually freeze their development, so they're stunted at a prepubescent state, except for their testes. Their testes can grow and mature. So you have these tiny little juvenile worms with giant grown-up testes that then go down into the tube of the female, attach, live off their yolk sacs, producing copious amounts of sperm for the female to use, and then when they die, the female just brings more in, and over time grows her harem that way. So this is a weird sexual strategy compared to us, right? <laughs> it's hard to imagine that these kind of things exist in the ocean. So, oh, and here's a, sorry, close-up of the female. These are a female, and she's releasing her fertilized eggs, thanks to this harem of males that live inside her. So the ocean has a huge diversity of ways of reproducing and creating more abundance in the sea. And while we have had trouble understanding these patterns and have not necessarily managed them in the best way in the past, the good news is that technology and research right now is exploding. We are having an absolute revolution in understanding sexual strategies in the ocean. So it's a really exciting and optimistic time to be able to dive in and talk about what we've learned and then start to apply that knowledge to better manage our ocean resources. So tonight I'm going to take you through just a couple of examples. And of course we have to think about that sex is the end of a long journey, right? So we don't just unfortunately have sex happen spontaneously. It takes a little bit of work. So there's three basic steps. And I'll give you the hint. The last step is actually the sex part. So what comes before the sex? Anybody? Finding a mate? Yeah. So in the ocean, that's a huge challenge. So there's the search and the find. Second step, what happens after you find a mate? Courtship. Yes, you got to woo them, right? You got to convince that individual that you are the one for them to get it on. So we've got three basic steps, search, seduction, and sex. So we're going to walk through a couple of examples of what that looks like when you're in the ocean. First example, this is a blue whale largest animal on the planet, but still a very, very tiny animal when it comes to the size of the ocean. So the ocean is 99% of the habitable space on the planet. So the living space that's available to animals, 99% of it is an ocean. So even for a blue whale, it can be really, really hard to cover that much distance to find a mate. And these males have to roam around the ocean looking for roving pods of females. So what can they do? Well, they rely on sound. So blue whales can sing at a very low frequency, and sound in the ocean travels much farther than it does on land. And so these blue whales sing songs to kind of broadcast their presence and try to listen for other whales who may be in the area. What's a really neat story about these guys is that a couple of years ago, researchers started to look through records of whale songs over the past few decades, and they noticed that something was happening. The whale songs in blue whales all across the globe was dropping. It's getting lower and lower and lower. I like to call this the Barry White effect. I can't do a good Barry White, but imagine these whales are going deeper and deeper with their love songs. And the scientists were trying to figure out why this would be. And so the theory that they've come up with is that 
Back in the mid 20th century, whales were at their lowest numbers. We had overhunted them hugely, so they were down in some places by over 95%. So a whale at that point in time were spaced few and far between, and all they really wanted to do was just scream as loudly as they could and try to find somebody. Is anybody else out there? So there's a certain pitch that they could use that would actually travel the farthest also at the loudest distance, at the loudest volume to find these other whales. But in a good news story of recovery, since we banned whaling and put a moratorium on hunting, the whale population has started to come up. And so then, not only are these males trying to just find somebody, now they're having to start to worry about competition. So they're starting to realize that there's other males out there, and they want to be able to show off their stuff to the females who they're trying to court. And across the animal kingdom, the fact, just through physics, is the bigger you are, the lower you can go and the louder you can go. So by showing a female that you can do a really low and loud sound, you can show her that you're the bigger, tougher guy. And this actually holds in humans too, by the way. Even though our connection between bigger and better doesn't always hold in our society anymore, females still find human females find the human male voice more attractive the deeper it is. So we have these blue whales singing lower and lower to try to attract these females and start to court these females, we think, or to try to outcompete the other males um, as their populations have recovered. Now when we talk about whales and we're in the realm of reproduction in the ocean, people are always wondering about the whale anatomy and how whales move into sex after they've done their courtship. And yes, whales are mammals, so they reproduce very much like us, and their body parts are very similar to us when it comes to their sexual apparatus. So a blue whale, just to get it off the table there, largest male member on the planet, reaching about 12 feet in length. Pretty impressive. But when it comes to body size, penis as a proportion of body size, which is really the only fair way to do comparisons, the blue whale is actually very similar to us. They're about 1 to 10, 1 to 11, we're at about 1 to 13. The really impressive, really cool, really athletic male phallus in the ocean belongs to the barnacle. So these are these tiny crustaceans that you see on pier pilings, on tide pools, on tops of whale heads. And these guys have a penis that is eight times longer than their body. It is huge. And the reason for this is that they are cemented to the spot where they land as a larvae. So when they develop, they can't move. So they have to grow this phenomenally huge penis that they can poke around the tide pools, trying to find a mate who's willing and opening their shell for them to come inside. So we always like to touch upon the barnacles. They can also change the shape of their penis depending on water currents and water flow. So pretty impressive. Now, Penis is one way that mammals um, compete and sort of try to show off their stuff. Body size is another. But when we're talking about genitals and proportion to body size, we can actually learn a lot about a mating strategy. So again, with the barnacle, very long penis stuck in place trying to find a mate. In mammals, we can look at not only penis size, but we can look at size of male testes. So in some males, they have proportionally very, very large testes. And one of the reasons why a male would grow really big cojones is because they're trying to compete with other males after sex has happened. So if you imagine that there's a female out there who's being mated with multiple times in a row with several males in quick succession, her reproductive tract becomes like a battleground for sperm. So you have sperm from different males competing to try to get to the egg. And one of the ways that males try to win this battle is by producing huge amounts of sperm that they can absolutely flush her tract with and get the other guy's wigglers out of the way and try to get theirs up as far as they can towards the cervix and the egg. And one of the most spectacular examples of this we see is in the North Atlantic right whale. This whale has in the largest testes on the planet proportion of body size and totally. Each one is half a ton. So it's a literal ton of testes, which is a huge, huge set to be carrying around. And it's much bigger than a blue whale's, even though the Atlantic right whale is much smaller as a, as a terms of total body size. So researchers had known for a really long time that Atlantic right whales were probably undergoing a lot of sperm competition, so having a lot of promiscuity in the population. And sure enough, they started to be able to see this following these whales around off the coast of Canada in the summertime. 
they form these very active surface groups with several males surrounding a single female at a time. These are highly, highly endangered whales. There's only about 300 left in the world. But the good news is they seem to be very frisky. So they have sex all year round, but particularly in the summer, even though that the females likely can only get pregnant during a certain window. But what researchers found one day, I don't know how well you can see this, they were studying some of the mating habits and trying to understand these very um, fluid systems with lots of mating partners. And what they discovered one day was there's a gentleman named Philip Clappen. He works with NOAA. And he was on a boat. They were tagging these whales and trying to see who was mating with who. And this female surfaced. This is the female here. And she rolled onto her belly. And for a really long time, researchers thought that by she, her doing this at the surface, it was a way for her to actually block mating and escape attempts of, of copulation. But it actually turns out that what happened was one male rolled up next to her on one side and released his long phallus to come up and in. And then about two seconds later, another male approached from here, rolled onto his side, and released his phallus to come on in. So this is the first documented case of simultaneous penetration in a whale. It's definitely the biggest threesome we've ever documented on the planet. And it shows absolutely the most intense sperm competition you can imagine, because these two males are competing now at exactly the same time to try to get their sperm to her egg. So this is all fascinating stories about whale sex. But there's one more aspect here. We've been focusing on the male parts. There's also the female parts. And there's some really cool research that's happening right now that has started to look at the female reproductive tract in dolphins and whales and porpoises. And what they're finding is that rather than just having simple tubes, in some species, vagina is much more like a maze. There are flaps and folds and blind alleys and dead ends and all sorts of traps and obstacles that make it very, very difficult for a sperm to find its way to an egg. And they think that the reason for this could be, and this is still under development, but it could be to help the female be able to actually screen some of that sperm in a system like the right whale, where she can't necessarily control which males are being given entry to her. She can maybe have some obstacles put in the way so that only the hardiest, most determined sperm can actually get to her egg in the end. So this is all new research that's just come out over the last few years, and we're starting to understand that these female systems are in place to help maybe with a little bit of selection going on again after sex has happened. So again, it's just another sign that we're just starting to learn how complex and fascinating these different systems are. But to return to a second to the story of the search and the sound where we began with the whales. So this is a picture of a North Atlantic right whale. They like to gather, like I said, off of uh, the east coast of Canada, but also off of Boston region, off of Massachusetts. It's a very high traffic zone, and we've had a lot of in, um, impacts between whales and ships that have been devastating to a population, again, that is so endangered. So the flip side of sound in the sea is that these animals, because they rely on sound, the more ship traffic, the more oil and gas exploration, the more um, naval sonar activities that we're putting in the ocean has started to create huge amounts of sound that are starting to mask the ability of these animals to find one another and communicate in the ocean. We know that these animals can talk from, communicate with one another from off the coast of Boston to whales off of the Caribbean. Through listening stations that have been placed, we can tell that they are actually talking back and forth. And the amount of noise pollution that we've now put into the oceans is starting to really put a damper on it. And I like to think of this, if you imagine those of us who've ever experienced online dating or thought about online dating, imagine if instead of having an international dating website where you can pick mates from across the world and cultures and all sorts of you know, different diversities, you're restricted to only meeting people in your hometown. Right? That's basically like what we're doing. By creating so much noise pollution, we're shrinking the area through which these whales can be searching and trying to find their mates. So this is a real problem. And researchers have started to actually come up with some really interesting solutions, not only by trying to ban certain sounds in certain areas of the ocean, but by actually using sound to cue and trigger ship captains of whale presence. So this is a picture, actually, you can't see it, but there's a buoy, a smart buoy, just off here that is sending signals and constantly listening for right whale sounds. And when it hears your white whale singing, 
it can kind of triangulate with some other buoys and send a message to a captain that there are whales in the area. This allows the captain to slow down his ship and post a person up on a watch, and they've actually reduced ship impacts by over half since the system has been in place. So it's a really great story of using the sound to also for, um, help with conservation in a, in, a, in a kind of a nice counter to the sound pollution we sometimes create. So that's one example of a search. Next example is, let's go to seduction. This is the lobsters. We don't think of lobsters as being particularly um, romantic, but they really are, and they're also quite kinky. So they're a nice little mix. So has anybody here had a main lobster? You come with the big claws, right? Okay, so this is how these animals come into being. So the best time for two lobsters to mate is right after the female molts. And there's a reason for this. It is because the female underneath her shell has a little pouch that stores sperm. And the sperm and the pouch get tossed out whenever the female molts with the old shell. And she gets a new pouch, which basically means that female lobsters can lose and regain their virginity every time they molt, which is kind of a cool trick. And for the female, she wants to, molt, she wants to mate right away so that she can fill that pouch with sperm and be able to fertilize multiple batches of her eggs as she goes. For the male, he wants to meet with her because he knows he's getting a fresh pouch that he can fill up and not have any sperm competition happening within that little um, bucket under her tail. The problem a female faces, though, is that a male is extremely aggressive during mating season. He's a total brute. He's beating up on everybody, trying to show his dominance. And when she molts, she's at her most vulnerable state. She is a soft-bodied animal. That shell is her strength and her armor. So she has to present herself to this total tyrant of a guy who's, you know, his instinct is to bash anybody who comes near when she is really soft-bodied and vulnerable. So what does she do? She seduces him with a love potion made of her pee. So <laughs> lobsters, their bladders sit below their brains and they have little nozzles just under their eyes that they can actually shoot urine from. And the female will creep up to the lobster's den for every day for about a week. And she will quickly douse him in the face with her pee and then book it out of there before he has a chance to attack. After about three, four, five days, the scent of her urine starts to take a hold on the male and actually puts him into a sort of trance-like state where he becomes very gentle and he actually starts to invite her into, the sh into his den. They will then live together for about a week and then right before she knows she's going to molt, this really cool process happens where she circles around in front of him and they're face to face. So now both of them are spraying each other with lots of their pee. This is their signal that they love one another. And the male puts his claws down into the sand and sort of bows his, his head down. The female comes up to him and taps him on one shoulder and then the other. And Dr. Yalatema is the one who observed this behavior for the first time, and he called it knighting. And it really looks like that. And basically what she's telling him is, don't go anywhere. This is all about to happen, like, right now. Stay. So she goes to the back of the den. She molts, which takes about half an hour to an hour. And then the male, the whole time while she's molting, is guarding over her. He's sort of sweeping his antenna around her, waiting for her to give him a signal. And when she does, he walks around behind her, again puts his claws into the sand, embraces himself with his tail, and then uses his small walking legs to pick up her body, roll her onto her back, and then belly to belly in the missionary position, he inserts his male parts into her sperm receptacle, couple of thrusts, deposits the sperm, very gently lays her back down. She then goes to the back of the den and he will stand guard for the next few days while her shell hardens and she recovers. She then leaves and he welcomes in the next female because they are serial monogamists. So that's how lobsters reproduce in the ocean. And it's all seduction by scent. And again, there's a connection here because the way that we impact the oceans right now, global warming is one, climate change is one, and global warming and ocean acidification are two aspects of climate change. Ocean acidification is us changing the pH. It's lowering the chemistry of the seawater. And what's happening is that these animals who rely on chemical messaging like this, like this pea potion, their messages can get scrambled as that basic seawater environment starts to change. And we're starting to see some effects of this. So again, it's a, it's a 
a little bit more indirect and it's hard to realize, but by changing the chemistry of the sea, we may be affecting the ability for these animals to send and receive these signals, which are really, really important for their sex lives and their seduction. Clownfish. Yeah, okay. Disney. Disney had a really wrong, 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 wrong. So clownfish um, <laughs> are sex changers. This is a very common strategy in animals. And the reason for sex change is, again, to boost reproductive output. And in clownfish, they change from males to females. So for those of you who are familiar with the movie, Nemo's mom gets eaten by a bar barracuda right at the beginning. And then his dad raises Nemo. And then they go on this adventure. But really what would have happened is as soon as Nemo's mom got knocked off, his dad would have morphed into his mom. And then Nemo would have grown his own adulthood as a male and mated with his father who was his mother, whose mother who is, was his father. It's a little confusing. But this is how clownfish do it. And the reason why they do it is because they are tasty, bite-sized, brightly colored fish on a reef. And so clownfish don't want to have to search for a mate. They don't want to have to swim around. It's too risky. So when they're little, they find an anemone, which is this animal back here, and they settle into it. And the stinging tentacles of that anemone serve as a very protective fortress. And this means that they're stuck basically mating with whoever they land with. The trick is, is that when a female lays, in, in clownfish, a female lays her eggs. And so she needs a male who can help her guard and protect those eggs. So she wants to make sure that that male that she is mated with is going to do his duty and not go running off with other females in the anemone trying to mate and be distracted. From the male's perspective, if he's going to invest in caring for these eggs, he wants to make sure that these eggs are only fertilized by him and nobody else. So he doesn't want any other adult males around who could be sneaking in and fertilizing her eggs. So only the two biggest fish, the biggest female and the biggest male in the anemone can mate. The advantage of switching from male to female as they grow inside is that fish have this really remarkable capacity to make more eggs the bigger they get. And this is really different, again, from mammals, right? So for a woman, we are born with all the eggs we will ever have in our lifetime, and that number goes down as we age. In fish, it's the opposite. If they're healthy, the larger the female grows, the more eggs she produces, and it can be exponentially more eggs. So you can double the size of the fish, and in some species, you have 10 times more eggs. So for this couple that is stuck in this anemone, they will make the most offspring if the biggest fish in the group is the female. Now, to make sure that nobody else is competing and maturing, these clownfish are actually huge bullies. And they will go around, and the other juveniles who kind of land in the anemone, the female will bully her big male to make sure he doesn't change into female. Get any ideas about that? Then the male will then go and bully the next biggest individual, making sure that he doesn't develop his testes. That guy then bullies the next juvenile, making sure he doesn't grow too big, and so on down the line. So you get this perfectly staggered hierarchy of basically psychologically warf psychological warfare of these clownfish trying to keep each other in suppressed development so that they can't reproduce and compete with one another. But the system works really well, because when the female then dies, the male transitions to female, grows bigger, makes all these eggs, and then the next one bumps up. So as long as they're patient, it all works out in the end for the juveniles, too. Groupers. OK, so we've talked now mostly about search, seduction, and sex change. Those are all strategies in the deep. Group sex is another one. So now we're moving into sealing the deal, that final step. And lots of animals in the ocean get together and have giant orgies. And the reason for this is that they release their egg and sperm out into the ocean. We can't do this on land because our sperm and eggs would dry up. It doesn't work so well. But in the ocean, it works really, really well. And it's, in fact, how sex first began. So you get animals that often will live independent lives getting together in these massive, massive groups for huge annual spawns. And the Nassau grouper is one of them. They're an endangered species in part because of this strategy. So every year, actually, right, almost it was with the full moon, what, last night, two nights ago? So right after the full moon, two, three days after the full moon, every single Nassau grouper on Little Cayman Island in the Caribbean, where they're now still in big numbers, they will shoot down to the southern tip of the island, every, literally every single one, because they've tagged almost every single one. 
and they will gather there and they will start to shift and shimmy and swirl with each other in these giant balls. And then right at sunset on the fourth day, they'll start to get agitated. And you'll see they'll kind of knock around and kind of start bumping up against each other. And then all of a sudden, these females whose bellies are swollen with eggs rocket up to the surface and just about 10 feet below the surface, they'll release a puff of eggs. The males will then shoot up after them, releasing their sperm and the fertilization happens in, in, in the uh, water column. And these huge funnels keep forming out of the main school. And so it's like geysers of fish erupting. We have a little video here that I'm hoping you'll be able to see. And this is a, uh, an example of how a mass orgy can, you coordin they coordinate these tight groups, but they're doing it again and again and again. And this is about 4,000 fish, and this will be a close-up. You'll see two fish coming in. It's a little dark, I think, but it'll get lighter. They're going to come swoop into this, um, your left on the screen, and shoot up and join a bunch of fish that are starting to spawn. And there they go. You can see there's just tons and tons. Can you guys see that okay? The cloud kind of forming of the sperm and eggs coming out. And when you're diving on a spawning aggregation like this, it's completely chaotic because you have thousands of fish swirling around. They're shooting up and the visibility goes from about 100 feet to you can't see in front of your face in, within minutes because of all of those sperm and eggs in the water. It's really pretty phenomenal. The problem is it makes these animals really vulnerable to overfishing, right? Because if Every single grown-up is getting together at the same time in a really predictable location. It makes it easy for the fish to find each other, but also for fishers to find the fish. And across the world, we have overfished these spawning aggregations so much that we're starting to see populations tank. So one of the things that we can think about is respecting the fact that these animals are only having sex once a year and that we should probably just let them do that for the little bit of time that they need to do that, make the next generation, and figure out a management plan that then allows us to fish more responsibly and more sustainably the other times of the year. So we're going to skip ahead. It's just a, this is a picture of jacks. So groupers and snappers and jacks, even tuna, a lot of the fish that we eat, reproduce in this manner. And I will wrap up here really quickly with corals. Corals are actually where my um, love affair with the ocean first began, studying corals and their reproductive habits on the ocean. And corals are tiny little animals. I'll zoom in here. Each of these circles is a polyp with a little coral animal inside. They sort of sit in these little cups that they make. And similar to the barnacle, when the coral lands, it is rooted to the spot. It cannot move. So it can't go off looking for a date. It can't even go seducing its mate. It just has to figure out how it can coordinate sex with about a million of its closest neighbors. That's basically what coral strategy is. And so what these animals do is they use the moon phase, similar to, to the grouper. They, they follow the full moons, but for Caribbean corals, it happens in the summer. And following about three to four days after the full moon, these coral, each individual animal will start to release a small bundle of egg and sperm. And that's what this kind of orange ball is that you see. So you can see some of them don't have it yet, and some of them do. And when you dive down at night, just after sunset, and you shine your dive light on a coral reef, at first, all the corals will not have any sort of markings. They'll sort of just look like rocks. And then within minutes, you'll see these small orange pink bundles start to arrive at the surface. And it looks like the coral's breaking out in hives, like having an allergic reaction. And then within seconds of that, all of a sudden, across miles and miles of reef, colonies of the same species, at it, literally you can time your watch to at the exact same moment, will release all their bundles. And you wind up surrounded by this swirling snowstorm of sperm egg bundles floating through the ocean. And it's, it's like being in a blizzard underwater. And this is a sequence of just one colony starting to release its eggs. And we don't know exactly how they coordinate this timing so well. Corals don't have much of a higher brain. But we know that the moon triggers the beginning of the bundle formation. The sunset triggers when they should bring the eggs to the surface. And then genetic cues, as well as probably cues from one another, are triggering exactly when to release. And I'll show you here a short clip so you can kind of get a sense of what this looks like. So this is from last year. And the good news is corals are very prolific. 
These bundles then will float to the surface where they break apart and the eggs and sperm of different individuals can then mix to form the next generation of coral colonies. So yeah, it just looks, kind of looks like a big snowstorm under there. The problem is, again, that these, these corals are coordinating with one another across the reef and they need to be in close contact with their neighbors in order to get this coordination right. And what's happened over the years through overfishing, through climate change, and through other insults that we've thrown at the reef, as corals die and are spaced farther and farther apart, the ability for them to coordinate that spawn goes down and their fertilization success starts to tank. So again, this is something that, you know, as humans, we were just like cozy up against each other. If we, you know, if we got separated from our mate, we just walked together. Corals can't do that. And so these are these indirect effects that we're having without realizing um, the impact that, that can come from, from our decreasing the amount of corals that are out there. So to end on a happy note, because <laughs> there is a happy note, as I said, part of what's so exciting right now is that while we are starting to learn about these sexual strategies and we're learning about our impacts, we're also learning about the solutions and the ways that we can actually fix things. And there's all sorts of great innovation and great new technology that's going on right now to sort of check the way that we used to manage marine life and interact with it and start to bring in new systems that will work more effectively to support these sexual strategies. And there's many I could go into, but I'm gonna sort of stick with three basic ones. So next time you go out to eat at a restaurant or to buy your seafood at a seafood store, think of sex-friendly seafood, right? <laughs> so what do I mean by sex-friendly seafood? So this is seafood from species that reproduce a lot, very frequently, and with some basically good management, they can withstand a bit of fishing pressure. This tends to be fish that are low on the food chain, so mackerels and sardines and herrings. It also are things like shellfish, like oysters and clams and mussels. These are fantastic options. They're really, really nutritious. They actually clean and filter the water column, and they reproduce gangbusters. So again, well-managed, they can do a great job. The other thing is do not fear farmed fish. Farmed fish has a really bad rap. There's a reason for it. It used to be done really, really poorly, and there are some cases where it still is. But in general, there are also great options that are now available for farm species, and especially if you start looking to the shellfish, seaweeds, and fish lower on the food chain again, this combination of sex-friendly and farmed is a great way to alleviate pressure on wild stocks that need a little bit of time and a little bit of peace and quiet to kind of get their business done and build their numbers back up. Finally, go on natural. We didn't touch upon it, but pollution entering the oceans is a huge, huge problem and really starting to mess with some of these reproductive strategies. So again, we talked about sex change. A lot of the animals in the oceans have very, very flexible sexual um, conditions. So they can turn from male to female, female to male, switching back and forth. And because of this fluidity, it means that some of the toxins that we're putting into our environment can really upset and affect what's happening. We're seeing males with female parts, females with male parts, and all of that disrupts their ability to successfully reproduce. So when thinking about it just in your own household, what is it that you're putting down the drain in terms of chemicals, and, and here in Boulder, everybody's pretty responsible about that, but it's, it's a good thing to think that, you know, all drains do lead to the ocean eventually. And thus far, our wastewater treatment systems don't actually filter out a lot of the stuff and a lot of the synthetic hormones and some of the pollutants that are causing some of these changes in the wild. So thinking a little bit more naturally about the products you're using in your homes and on your own bodies is also good to preserve the sex lives of these animals. But ultimately, I want to leave you with a thought of ocean optimism. And this is because right now there's more work being done than ever to fix these problems. The awareness has grown exponentially. There are wonderful stories of seafood companies that are changing their sourcing policies to try to get better, more sustainable fish. There's great technology that is starting to monitor systems from space so that we can make sure that marine reserves that are supposed to protect spawning aggregation and spawning sites don't have pirate fishermen coming in and taking uh, advantage of these species when they're, when they're reproducing. So there's all sorts of leaps and bounds. This hashtag is something, if you're interested, you can follow to hear all of the really good news stories that are out there and start to participate in some of the activities that are helping to turn up the sex drive in the ocean. 
And finally, I have to acknowledge that um, if you do buy a copy of the book, you will see it's filled with many, many tales. And all of those are based on the work of dozens of researchers who, um, whose blood, sweat, and tears goes into trying to figure out these systems. It is difficult to study reproduction in the ocean. And so I just thank all of them for giving, giving them my time and access to their research so that I could turn it into these um, slightly naughty stories. And with that, I'll say thank you and take any questions. It's a, you know, it's a really good question. I think that they, they still go on. So it's likely the shift in uh, moonlight that is happening over the days, as well as water temperature starting to cue that it's the summer season. So they seem pretty in sync, but sometimes you can have a lower night where not every coral goes, and then all of a sudden a bunch will go the next night um, if, if there is a particularly dim or cloudy night. Yeah. Yes? Friendly or, or, you know. Yeah, so shrimp are tricky. Shrimp are sex changers. So most of the shrimp you're eating are females. They go from male to female. And there are some very well harvested shrimp. Um, Gulf Wild is a great brand to look for. They're, they're particularly uh, sustainably harvested. Um, farm shrimp in the US is a good option as well. You want to avoid farm shrimp from Southeast Asia region. Um, they they're really uh, trashing the environment, and there's a lot of chemicals that go into those. So for your own health, not a good option. Um, how, do you know, uh, how, how do you know? Yeah, how do you know? So from? one of yeah. So this is um, this is a, a really great point. So some products will be well labeled, most are not when it comes to seafood. And one of the best things that you can do is to start asking your retail. So whether it's the fishmonger behind you know the retail counter or the chef in your restaurant, ask where that fish came from. They may not be able to answer the first one or two or three times, in which case choose something else. But by all of us starting to ask and starting to show that we actually expect that information in order to eat the seafood, it starts to set that precedent. They will then start to demand that information from their suppliers who demand it from the wholesalers, and it works on down the chain. And this is something I'm really active working, actively working on with Future of Fish. And it is starting to shift, but we we would very much benefit from that consumer push to say, just like we want to know, you know, is it grass-fed beef or is it, you know, cage-free eggs? We want to know the same thing for seafood, whether it's you value local or you value, um, you know, antibiotic-free for farm fish. Being able to know the story behind your seafood is huge, so ask, ask for it. Um, but some packaging will have it, and there's some good brands. I also often recommend checking out Monterey Bay Aquarium they have something called the Seafood Watch. And it's a, a, a really good resource for basic understanding of which fish are good to go for, um, shellfish, shrimp, as it is all included, which ones to avoid. So they're, they're a really good resource for that. And NOAA actually, the, the US government site also has Fish Watch, which is uh, for all US managed fisheries and gives some guidelines there. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Anybody else? Sure, Sarah. I know it's I have to say I I don't I don't feel like I know the details enough because I feel like that's a really it's cutting it really close um, in theory it's a great idea because so as, as Sarah was saying with some of these squid they only they spawn at the end of their life and they get together in these huge groups they have a mass spawn and then they all die and that just all their bodies just sink sink down or are eaten by other marine life. So technically, if you were to harvest them right after they spawned, it, it could be a great way to get a lot of really nutritious protein. But knowing exactly when that spawning is happening, knowing that you're not um, in place, disrupting whatever behaviors are coming beforehand to trigger the spawn um, is where I would be concerned. But I, I, in theory, it sounds good. I'm nervous about in practice, but I don't know enough to say yay or nay. That's how I'd hedge that one. <laughs> it's a really good question. Yeah, Kurt. Could you tell us the moment that you knew you had to do this book? 
Instead of like a yeah, book or a yeah, book. <laughs> definitely. And there was a moment. Um, so for a while, I'd been trying to figure out how I could talk about some of the destruction I was seeing when I was diving on these reefs, and make it so that people who don't normally don't think about oceans would care. And I was <laughs> I was at a cocktail party, and I was talking with a group of friends, and we were all sort of um, bemoaning not understanding the opposite sex. And one of my girlfriends at the time made a comment, you know, I just wish I could be a guy for a day, you know, like be in their body, be in their head, know what they're thinking, know what they want. And I, as a total nerdy biologist offhand said, yeah, if only we could be parrotfish. And everybody sort of like gave me this look like, what are you talking about? I said, oh, you know, parrotfish, they start as females and turn into males. Everybody just kind of kept looking at me and I was like, so a lot of fish do this, this is really common. And I wound up explaining, you know, that this happens in the sea. And then I sort of said, you know, and if you think about it, that adds a level of complexity to how we manage fisheries. Because oftentimes, we like to catch the biggest fish. And if you're catching all the biggest fish, you would be pulling out all the males. So not only do you have to worry about the numbers, but now you're skewing the sex ratio. And just leaving females, it's kind of hard to get it on. Everybody listened. Everybody was still paying attention. And this was like at a social cocktail party. And then about half an hour later, I was refilling my drink. And I heard somebody who I'd been talking to retelling the story to somebody else. And that's when I was like, that's it. Sex. Everybody, everybody's curious about it, even if they don't admit it. So we'll talk about all these weird, wonderful ways that animals reproduce and the connection between sex and sustainability. And maybe we can, yeah, kind of entertain a new crowd. <laughs> That was where it came from about 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have, and I highly recommend them. So this is Isabella Rosalini did a wonderful series on uh, Sundance for, for Sundance on, um, called Green Porno. And she really takes it all the way, dressing up in wild costumes to recreate uh, the love lives of these animals. And she has a lot of wonderful undersea ones. Yeah. Anybody else? Any questions? Well, thank you for you know, covering the bad news going on, the destruction that you're seeing as well. But um, I appreciate you bringing this whole other aspect of both lives down there that I hadn't thought about much. But on the uh, positive note end of things, I understand that the Obama administration designated a couple of marine sanctuaries recently. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could speak to that. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that there. Also, actually, I'm, I'm learning that healthy soil um, becomes a carbon sink. Mm -hmm. um, if it's mistreated, it releases carbon. I, I imagine the ocean must be the same way. If it's healthy, it's a carbon sink. If it's not, it releases. Can you speak to that? Yeah, sure. So to touch on the marine reserves first. So. One of, again, a really great trend that is happening right now in the oceans is we are starting to see many more um, protected areas, and in particular, no-take areas. So this means no extractive activities are allowed whatsoever. We're also seeing not only more of them, but larger ones, so really, really big marine reserves. We're talking you know, over 100,000 square kilometers. And this is definitely needed. In the oceans right now, there's still less than 1% of the area is protected. That's compared to 10, uh, 15 to 20% on land. So we really are lagging in the ocean in terms of giving some of this wildlife just their own little boudoir to do their business and, and not have to deal with our intrusions. So this is, this is a really great trend to see. And it's facilitated by um, better thoughts around ocean zoning, so that often these no-take areas are part of a larger plan. And there's some really great work being done um, by the Waite Institute on this to get zoning on sort of national scales. It's also due to things like satellites. So there's a great group called Sky Truth. And there was actually just an article in the New York Times recently that talked about the, they use satellite technology again to track these pirate ships that are sneaking into reserved and closed areas and conducting illegal fishing. And it all sounds like very, I don't know, Hollywood pirates and all these things, but it's, it's really true. And using the satellite technology, small island nations like Palau actually now have the capacity to enforce 
their giant, giant closed areas, which never before could they do because it was just too big and they didn't have the resources to do it. So it's a really um, wonderful trend and I'm really encouraged by it. And I think we're gonna start to see some, some big shifts um, as these, these reserves and the technology kind of come together. In terms of climate change, so the oceans are, um, have always been a sink for carbon even when they have not been the most healthy. Just the nature of seawater, it ab absorbs uh, carbon dioxide. So they are a natural sink. In fact, they are the reason we are not um, way, way hotter than we are. We would be goners if it wasn't for the ocean at this point. Um, their capacity to do so slows down um, the more carbon we're putting in there. But there are ways that we can assist, things like seaweeds. Um, farming seaweeds, growing more seaweeds, um, protecting the seaweed forests that are there. They're a great source, um, and uh, sorry, carbon sink. So um, coral reefs, it's a little bit tricky to tell exactly what's happening, but they do um, take some carbon out of the water when they make their skeletons, same with oysters, and store it for generally you know, millennia, long, long periods of time. So as their health declines, the capacity for them to do that does go down. So yeah, healthy oceans, help, help kind of stem that tide a bit too. All right. Thank you all for coming. I encourage you to grab a book and have Mara sign it. Thank you again. Thanks guys.